Hello and welcome to the final SBK podcast for the Aintree Grand National Meeting this year. I'm Tom Collins and I'm joined by Ross Miller as ever for this 15-minute episode where we'll cover all the racing from Liverpool on Saturday. Grand National will be a little bit curtailed, but the rest will be in full. Ross, I'm going to throw you straight under the bus here. You're not prepared for this, but I'm doing it. Uh, it's a two-part question for you. Firstly, where would the Grand National rank in your personal favourite races? And secondly, where do you think it ranks in terms of the most prestigious prizes to win in the world of horse racing? Oh, TC, you have chucked me under the bus. It, <laughs> it would be top five. I really love the the the, 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 the Arco, the Champion Chase, the Gold Cup, obviously. They're, they're, they would be above it in terms of how much I love the race. Um, yeah, it'd be top five. I enjoy it. And what was part two? I've forgotten already. You've panicked me that much. <laughs> Where would it rank, in your opinion, in the most prestigious prizes in the world of horse racing? Obviously, you've got the Derby, you've got racing in the US, Kentucky Derby, etc. Um, I don't know, the Melbourne Cup. Where would you say it ranks amongst all of those? Uh, well, it's, it's amazing isn't it? when you speak to anyone in racing, they say that the general public, they if they find out they're a trainer or a jockey, the first question they ask is, have you, have you won the Grand National? So that that does tell its own story. Um for me, if I could only watch one race a year, it wouldn't be the national. But I think it's up there. I mean, I think the Gold Cup is just the ultimate test, isn't it? It, it requires the stamina. It requires the, the speed. Um, yeah, again, top five. American racing, as you know, Kentucky Derby. I, you, you're gradually bringing me on to it. I find myself watching it now thinking, oh, God, what's happening? But um, yeah, top five again. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think uh, the Grand National is one of the most well-known races throughout the whole world. I mean, I went to America a few times and, and spoke to just a random couple of people at the racetrack and they said, we watched the Grand National. So, you know, even in America where jumps racing is not a big thing, everyone seems to watch this race. For me personally, it would probably be top 10, maybe sixth or seventh behind some of the big flat races. But this is the race everyone's going to be tuning in for on Saturday, albeit it's not as much of a spectacle as it maybe used to be. Okay, let's move on and talk about the racing on Saturday, which everyone has tuned in for. We begin with the extended three-mile handicap hurdle at 120. Dan Skelton has won two of the last four editions of this race and has West Balboa this year. Now, he heads the market currently at around 5-1. to one. I really like him. Do you? Uh, no, I've got two I'm going to go against you with, TC, and, and, and their form slightly ties in. Uh, Cuthbert Dibble is the first. Heavy ground is absolutely optimal for him. He got outpaced on soft ground at Cheltenham in the per attempts last time. Stayed on well. He gets a £5 pull for, for Montmorel there, who was the winner uh, for three lengths. Unlike Montmorel, Cuthbert Dibble is largely very consistent. He gives his running. Um, I still think he's a well-handicapped horse. And I think if the, if the rain keeps falling into Saturday and we get heavy ground, uh, he's certainly one I want to be with. And then form that ties in with him is Lord Snooty for Christian Williams. It was reported to the stewards last time when he ran very poorly that he objected to the first time tongue tie. And some horses just won't face up to that because it goes round their tongue. It ties the jaw. You know, like any, some of us don't like tight fitting clothing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that didn't go go for him. But on his penultimate start behind before that, he was second to Cuthbert Dibble and he was hampered at a crucial stage. Rallied really well, was only denied by half a length. Now, he gets a pull of between six and 11 pounds at the weight, and that depends how you value Finn Lambert, who rode Cuthbert Dibble on that occasion for his five pound claim. Personally, I think Finn is very good for five pounds, so I think it's a pretty sizable pull at the weights Lord Snooty's got. Christian Williams really starting to hit form now. Um, I think this horse is very well handicapped still. 10 stone seven is no weight at all for this sort of test. Um, so those will be my two against the field. Cusper Dibble currently 13 to 2 and Lord Snooty 16 to 1. Uh, I will make the case now for West Balboa. He was so impressive in this race last year. He also smashed Brewing Up a Storm on his comeback. Now, I know Brewing Up a Storm is entering the veteran years of his uh, campaign. And also, he hasn't been great this season on the whole, though he was good last time in Ireland and proved that he still has quality. The last two runs to West Balboa just scream to me that this has always been the target. It's a very much Dan Skelton plot job, in my opinion, and he's going to love being back at Aintree. He seemed to handle this track in, in fantastic style 12 months ago. So I'm hoping we get off the mark with a favourite uh, on Saturday afternoon. On to the Mersey Novices Hurdle now at 1.55pm, a race that sees the return to the track for Caldwell Potter, a Grade 1 winner who was sold for 740000 at the Caldwell Dispersal Sale and now makes his debut for Paul Nichols. Does he have a good chance? And if so, is he your selection? Uh, I think he's got a very good chance, TC. I think he's 
probably going to turn out to be the best horse in the race. I mean, certainly those that have paid that money for him will be, will be hoping that's absolutely the case. Um, but I think it's worth pointing out that the, the horses that were bought out of that dispersal sale that have travelled across the water to end up with Harry Derham and Warren Greatrex, they've run poorly since. Now, unlike with Caldwell Potter, Paul Nichols said straight away he wasn't going to chat them, was going to give him time. Harry Derham and Warren Greatrex weren't as patient, were keen perhaps to get them out. This extra time might just help, but moving a horse mid-season across the water, change of routine, change of feed, change of hay, there's enough banana skins there. If he doesn't run poorly, I wouldn't give up on him, and I certainly wouldn't be one on the social media saying, what a waste of money. Um, he's the exciting horse. Brighter days ahead. She needs to bounce back, doesn't she? I mean, it was a little bit of egg on face, I think, for Gordon Elliott at, at Cheltenham. You know, he'd been very, very sort of boisterous about her chances in the lead up to the to the festival and it didn't happen and then there was a few sort of commentators from the racing post that pointed out that when Willie Mullins is boisterous and confident he just wins and pointed out that Gordon Elliott hadn't that's not going to have gone over very well I don't think so you can guarantee that she's going to be cherry ripe and this extra trip might suit her and the ground then you've got Il Atlantique and Jimmy DeSoil who were pretty closely matched went in behind the impressive Bally Burn in the uh I can't remember what it's called now, but the, the, the two and a half mile at uh, Chatham, it changed names so many times I forgot. <laughs> I forgot with it. Um, the Gallagher. I've, yeah, Jimmy DeSoul was ridden off the pace, wasn't he? And I think perhaps picked up the pieces. Um, I'd side with the Atlantique slightly. Be interesting to see which way Paul Town then goes. It's a race I'm going to watch, not bet, but he would be this tentative selection. I think he's got less questions to answer than some of them. Yeah, it's an interesting race, isn't it? I think Brighter Days Ahead is going to draw a lot of the market support just purely because everyone on social media was hyping her up, as well as Gordon Elliott and uh, his head lad and other members of the team prior to Cheltenham. So she comes in here with a huge reputation and therefore she's going to take money again, despite losing last month when Jack Kennedy just wasn't at his best. I hope Caldwell Potter actually gets the job done for Paul Nichols. I probably won't bet in this race, but five to two seems a fair price. And if this horse has taken a step forward for the move of yards, then he's definitely got a, a fantastic chance, especially at the weights. There is another horse in here in Staffordshire, not who was also purchased from that dispersal sale for five hundred and ten thousand. Doesn't look like a great bit of uh, of purchasing there for my money, but we'll see. Um, next race is the two thirty, and it's back to handicap company. And what three mile one furlong chase? Crebley, King of Rye Hope. They had the market at five to one each of two, both of which have had just four starts over fences and remain very lightly raced. I would slightly favour the latter, King of Rye Hope. What about you? Uh, yeah, I, th I think so, TC. He was a massive eye-catcher in the Rendlesham last time. He came there absolutely swinging, and it looked like a case of how far he'd win by. Then missed the last two fences, hung left, but also didn't finish all that strongly. Now, whether that's because once he'd made a mistake, they were thinking straight away about his handicap mark, and they didn't want to be a you know, close beaten second and go up in the handicap, I'm not sure. But just have a question mark over his stamina on this ground at this trip. Um, Kribili, just think he can flat to see with his jumping at times. Um, I could avoid him. I just thought forward plan was an impressive winner in the Coral Trophy, the old Racing Post Trophy last time. Only got a £4 rise. He's not gone up a massive amount in the weights this season, having won two decent enough pots. Um He'll cope with soft ground. If it's heavy, it's a question mark. But I think that's the case for a lot of these. Um, flat track, left-handed. I think he's got plenty going for him. Um, and I still think he's on a decent enough mark. Probably has to find a little bit of improvement, but that's not beyond him. So forward plan would be a tentative one for me in that. Yeah, he's 13-2. to two, And if this does uh, turn out to be a bit of a staying contest, a race where the stamina horses come out on top, he's probably going to be right there at the finish because he's very strong over the distance. I'm surprised you didn't mention Fugitive, a horse that you love uh, and that you've mentioned virtually in every race so far this season. So give me a word on him. So th they, they were left scratching their head, TC, after after his run in the, in the Ryanair. The ground came. They were really hopeful. Uh, they had his heart checked at the track because he sort of stopped quite quickly. But Richard Hobson has mentioned on a couple of occasions that he is more than a quirky character and that if he gets a little bit left behind on the gallop, he doesn't try all that much. But equally, if he works in front, with by himself he's he's in another county so the thinking was that maybe he just got himself a little bit dropped out and slightly didn't fancy it he's going to definitely be comfortable at this trip at this pace um but he's had quite a long season and he was disappointing at 
entry last time. So that was my reason, and I should say only my reason, nothing from Richard or Carl, as to why I've not fancied him. Um, I just wonder whether perhaps he's best earlier in the season. On to the Grade 1 Liverpool hurdle now, which is basically a dialed-down stayers hurdle. Uh, Florian Porto is a 3-1 to favourite. Sai de Berle, who's won the last two renewals of this race, is currently 7-2. to Second favourite in the market. You've got Crambo, strong leader, Botox has, etc. in this race. What are your views? Uh, my view is that dialed down is a brilliant bit of wordsmithery there, TC. Yeah, dialed, let's say dialed down. Um, uh, my thoughts are Crambo is too big at 7-1. to one. That's for certain, you know. He was a short price for the stairs hurdle. He's a young, improving horse. And it never ceases to amaze me that people see a horse run badly once and it's just, they're no good, they're done. They What they've shown previously is their limit and they're not up to this grade. I'd be very surprised if at the end of his career, Cranbert hasn't won a grade one. I'm sure he will. He's got to relax. He was too keen in a crawl last time. And we talk about it all the time, don't we? Florian Porter gets to the front, drops anchor, dictates his own pace. At some point, someone's going to be brave enough just to say, we're not allowing you to do that. But I looked at the field and I don't know who quite who does that without compromising their own their own chance. Um, if they can push the pace along a little bit, that's going to help him settle. And I think he is a talented horse. Flat track might just suit him a bit better too. Thought seven to one was too big. But there's one for me that just stands out as having his conditions, and that's Botox has. He loves soft ground, heavy ground, flat left-handed track. He's really good around Haydock. He's got that here, and he arrives fresh. He's not run for 50-plus days. He missed Cheltenham. Uh, I think that gives him a little bit of an advantage, and he's the one I want to be with. <clears throat> Botox has is currently 12-1. to 1. He's a very good price. I should mention that Hewitt's in the race. He's having his first start since winning the King George around Christmas time. Uh, he is obviously going back over hurdles. He's 16 to 1. Could be interesting if he can reproduce what we saw at Kempton. If this was good ground or even good to soft ground, I'd be all over strong leader for Ollie Murphy, but he's just not going to like conditions. He still might run OK, but 9 to 1 is a little bit on the short side. So therefore, I'd probably just watch uh, this year's renewal of the Liverpool hurdle. The Grand National is up next. Of course, we've already done a whole in-depth Grand National preview. Go check it out on uh, SBK's YouTube or Spotify channel. And then you can look and listen to myself, Ross and Jeff Stafford running through every single horse in the lineup with an analysis. And then our one, two, three, four at the end. Go check that out. Now, we will briefly mention the couple of horses that we like, but like in that race, but we're going to keep it very short for this podcast. Ross, who's your likely winner or likely winners? So I, li- I like Nasla. I mean, he's, he's got plenty of weight, but the point I keep coming back to is it's only £4 or £5 more now, actually, because uh, Conflated came out. Then he carried in the Welsh National and he sluiced up. And my, my point is, is he a one six one horse? Most definitely not, other than on a specific set of circumstances, which he gets here, which is going to be very slow ground, a severe stamina test, and running against horses that simply aren't going to handle conditions. So I thought he was interesting. Mr. Incredible, we we differ on. Um, I thought he was running a big race last time. The saddle slipped and he lost Brian Hayes at the canal turn. I thought he ran a big race in the Midland National last time. He's going to love ground conditions. And provided he gets into a rhythm, I think he's well handicapped. Uh, Delta Work, as looks have been laid out for this race, has run well in it previously. Soft ground is going to really help him. Um, so I thought he was interesting as well. So they'll be my, my, my three big fancies. I'll probably have five or six bets and I'll perhaps put them on social media uh, on the Saturday morning. Yeah, it's going to be a fantastic renewal of the race. Smaller field this time around, but no smaller excitement, if that makes any sense whatsoever. Uh, Vanillier and Panda Boy are going to be at the top of my list for the event, Vanillier being the number one for me. Um, the penultimate race is the Grade 1 Magool Novices Chase over two miles, which features Arkle runner-up, found a 50. The unexposed Etalon, who was actually entered in the handicap on Thursday, but instead they've come here to this Grade 1 contest. And the prolific Hercule de Soy, I really like Etalon as a horse. He's a very shrewd and quick jumper through his uh, races. Two miles is perfect for him. He's going to be my play. Do you agree? Yeah, absolutely, TC. I mean, found a 50 sets the standard, but it's not a lofty standard, is it? We spoke on on the, the podcast for Thursday that whether Etalon had been left out because they felt they could win with an unexpected party. I think Etalon was left out because they think they can win a better prize with him. Uh, he's going to love the ground. He's got bags of power when you see him as a horse, bags of pace. As you said, his jumping, there's not a better novice jumping two-miler, I don't think. He's exceptional. He's got £13 to find, which seems a lot, but I I would have really fancied him in a handicap. thought he was very well treated. 
Um, I, I think he'll beat these. I think he's a really smart horse. And unusually for the Skeletons, they have taken their time with him. Normally, they're very quick to, to go and win some early money. Um, I think they know exactly what they've got here and they're treating him like a, a really smart horse. Yeah, I completely agree. Finally, we get to the curtain raiser, a grade two, two mile, one furlong bumper. And this feels weird to say, but my best bet of the whole meeting at Aintree this year comes in this race and it's Mr. Maggot. Now, I've been extremely high on him since his debut win, where he frankly sprinted clear of a subsequent winner called Denimethi, trained by Fergal O'Brien. He won that race in the style of an exceptional horse. Now, first time up, you can run against pretty below par horses and you could win very impressively, but you might not have beaten much. I don't think that was a bad race, though. And I love the, the acceleration he showed. You just don't see that very often. Immediately, he was uh, one of the horses I mentioned in the Jumps um, anti-post preview podcast we filmed all the way back in November as a dark horse to follow this year. He's only had one subsequent start. He was sent off a short price favourite in a small field. Didn't come off the bridle. I really like him in the bumper. Do you have any strong opinions in this race, Ross? Uh, my strong opinion is that I think you're absolutely spot on. I think he's a, a really smart horse in the making. I always get slightly jittery around John Joe O'Neill's sort of maintaining form from day to day, never mind week to week. That would be my only negative with Mr. Meggett. Um, I will perhaps play the forecast and add Castle Ivers for Ollie Murphy into that forecast. It takes quite a bit to win a bumper under a penalty, particularly on, on slow ground, which is what both these horses have done. And Castle Ivers did it at Weatherby last time. Absolutely cruised around, came under you know, minimal pressure for three strides to go and get the race won and, and careered away. What he's beaten, we don't know because they've not run yet, but he was carrying a penalty. The ground was slow. I think he's a smart horse as well. Probably not quite as smart as Mr. Meggett. So I'll play the two of them in a forecast, I think. Yeah, it's a really exciting race to finish. Bumpers aren't always overly exciting, Cheltenham bumper aside, but uh, I think this is a good race and there's going to be plenty of subsequent winners from it. Okay, it's time for nap and next best time on Saturday. Ross, off you go. The so nap is Etalon in the five o'clock, the, the two mile novice chase, and the next best is Botox has in the 305, the uh, what should you call it? Diluted, dialed down, stay as her. Yeah, exactly that. Etalon is currently six to one, and Botox has is 12 to one at the time of recording. My nap, as I've already said, is Mr. Maggot in the closing bumper at 535. He's around nine to four right now. Look, it's a pretty short price for a race like this, but I think it's fair given his unbelievable upside. My next best is going to be West Balboa in the opener at 120, around six or five to one. One offer for you to quickly know about before we sign off. All new SBK users get £30 in free bets when you sign up and bet £10 for the first time. Go check out SBK for that offer and many more promotions over the next week and in the future. Hopefully we witness a fantastic Grand National, pick a winner or at least a couple of places. We'll be back next Thursday for our customary Saturday podcast. Jeff Stafford will be hosting. Myself and Ross will be on the analyst panel. Until we see you then, be lucky.